And Paul explained that the grace of God came training us to renounce ungodliness and walk in righteousness. Jesus Christ gave himself on the cross so that we might become a people, remember verse 14, zealous for good works. Remember he uses the noun that we should be zealots for good works, fanatics for good works, you could say. And that's what we're going to talk about today are good works. Sound doctrine is absolutely key. You need to have the right theology. That's why we're recording the podcast. That's why we taught through the books of Daniel and Revelation, a lot of sound doctrine. But teaching must always bear good fruit. Jesus said that's the evidence of sound doctrine is that it bears good fruit. And fruit is something that happens naturally. But as we saw last week and this week as well, it is also something to be taught and instructed that not just here's what we believe, but here's how we act as Christians. And as disciples of Jesus, which is that's what a Christian is, isn't it? At the end of the day, a Christian is a disciple of Jesus Christ, someone that wants to live and believe and follow Christ. We must never lose sight of the fact that his teachings did not just consist of cosmic pronouncements about the nature of God and the universe. He had a lot of those. If you want to be saved, you must eat my flesh and drink my blood. And the guy's like, whoa, man, this guy, we never anybody speak like this, man. This is heavy stuff. But a lot, and maybe even most of what Jesus talked about was practical, everyday instructions for life. And we can get a misunderstanding about what maturity in Christ is by saying, well, maturity in Christ is when you really don't worry about that stuff anymore. What you really care about is the depths of the doctrines and end times and and the other ins and outs of theology. Not that those things are not important, but if we're disciples of Christ, we better be living as Christ taught us to live, right? How you live is inextricably tied to what you believe. Some folks want to say, how I live doesn't matter because I believe the right things. Some people say, what I believe doesn't matter because I do the right things. Well, neither one of those is important or is uh, true. Both of them are important. And it's my job, the first word of chapter 3, to remind you of how to live. That's my job as a pastor. This is actually a really uh, great passage for me because he just straight up tells me what to preach today. As we read this, you're going to see where he says, remind them. So that's what I'm going to do today. I'm going to remind you of things you already know. None of these are that difficult. But these commandments, I will say that we're going to read today and talk about super practical, but not popular, especially as we are getting ready to go into an election year. And you can already feel it starting, can't you? You know how when you, you drive by, let's say you drive by full moon and they've got the smoker working and you can smell it in your car, and it doesn't matter if it's 10 degrees outside, you roll the window down and breathe that in. You're getting excited. Your flesh is getting excited because I'm about to be fed. I'm about to be satisfied. And there can be disappointment when you have to keep driving, right? In the similar way, your flesh can sense that the election year is coming, and that's when I get to, like, yell at people, and I get to, like, have these strong, passionate emotions back and forth, and your flesh is like, all right, here we go again. Well, That's not what we should be doing, is it? You can feel everybody like, oh, here it comes, 2024, here it comes, let's go. I want it to be said that the church of Jesus Christ, going into one of those, obviously going to be one of the most contentious seasons that we've lived through in some time, we're sitting in in the church around Christmas time talking about the importance of being courteous. I didn't plan it this way. The Lord orchestrated it this way. So we better read this. Chapter 3, verses 1 and 2. Practical living, friends, not just doctrine. Both are important. Here we go. Titus, Paul says, remind them to be submissive to rulers and authorities, to be obedient, to be ready for every good work, to speak evil of no one, to avoid quarreling, to be gentle, and to show perfect courtesy toward all people. Some of those you hear and you go, oof, (laughs) oof, I'm already in trouble. (laughs) Well, there's seven instructions that Paul gives, and y'all, there's nothing too complicated today. We're just going to talk about these seven things of how we're supposed to act, how we're supposed to live, and then we're going to walk out, and by the power of God, we're going to do our best to live it out, okay? So first of all, I remind you to be submissive to rulers and authorities, 
And all God's people said, yes, all right. That's my favorite commandment in the Bible right there. And just in case you thought you might be able to wriggle out of it, it is talking about the government there, all right? There are places where the rulers and authorities refer to supernatural ranks of, of uh, the heavenly hosts. That's not what he's talking about here. He's talking about the government. Now, we are a country that was founded on revolution and that we have the right to cast off the government. All right, that's an American thing. Let's look at what the Christian thing says. It is a firm biblical principle that you should submit to the rulers and authorities. And friends, I don't like it much better than any of you. But let's remember Romans chapter 13, verses 1 and 2. Let every person be subject to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except from God. And those that exist have been instituted by God. Therefore, whoever resists the authorities resists what God has appointed, and those who resist will incur judgment. Hmm. <laughs> you know, it's really funny. If the person who I'm about to refer to is watching this, I love you to death, but you, you handed me the perfect illustration, and I'm going to use it. So we post our, our, our stuff on YouTube, and uh, most of the time, we get very nice things said by people. Hey, this is great. Oh, praise the Lord. This is wonderful. I love that. Well, when I posted our message from Romans chapter 13 on YouTube, people, the fangs and the claws came out, man. And one lady said, Pastor Tyler, I usually love your teachings, but this one made me want to rip off my skin and stomp on it. Interesting reaction to that, isn't it? <laughs> to which I have to say, well, it's not like I came up with it, friends. I'm just here to remind you, to remind you. The Bible makes it so abundantly clear that it is God who raises up and tears down rulers, that nations and kings and people don't rise to power unless God put them there. Now, the primary reason, Paul goes on to explain in Romans 13, is to maintain social order. That's the main reason we have government in the first place. It goes all the way back to the flood, when God was talking to Noah after the flood was over. That th we need these institutions in place to keep order. The Bible is not anarchist, okay? The Bible is very much pro-state, that we need that. It's an important thing. But God also raises up leaders to serve his purposes, because people will inevitably say things like, well, what about Napoleon? What about Hitler? What about Stalin? We can believe that just as God raised up Nebuchadnezzar and Assyria and Cyrus and Nero for a purpose, God raises up the wicked men of our own days for his purposes as well. And there's a whole depth of things we could talk about here, but let's just look at the basic principle and remind ourselves of the truth here. A Christian is to be the finest citizen that any governor or mayor or senator or president ever had. That I'm glad there's a lot of Christians in this country because they do what's right. Ranging here from traffic laws, traffic laws. You know, when I was a younger man, I was listening. When you, if you grew up in Calvary Chapel, you listened to a lot of what we call Chuck tracks. It's Pastor Chuck's Bible studies, and you listen to them. Whenever he talked about anger, he always talked about road rage. And I always thought that that was like a soft application, like, oh, come on. To what about, you know, when somebody gets in your face? I want to hear about anger then. And then I started driving. <laughs> then I started driving, and then I began to understand. When you, someone cuts you off on the freeway, and then you roll up to the stoplight, and then they open their car, and they start yelling at you from their door... And, that's when you need to remember <laughs> God's commandments, right? Traffic laws, like Christians, we don't mess around with that stuff. Taxes, well, I don't have to pay taxes. If they're using them for wicked stuff. What did Jesus say? Render to Caesar what belongs to Caesar and God what belongs to God. Now, what was Caesar doing with all that tax money? He was building idolatrous temples. So God is not going to hold you responsible for how your tax money is spent. Can you say praise the Lord for that? So pull out that dollar bill and say, whose face is on that? Washington. Well, render to Washington what belongs to Washington. Remember, to God, render to God what belongs to God. This applies to public order, that Christians are not to be causing trouble. We're not out there making, making life miserable for other people and being disorderly. We obey even things like building codes. And I've, I've had my share of disagreements about building codes before. But we're not the kind of people, we don't want people to groan because, oh, the, the church is here again. 
We don't resist arrest. We don't act violently. We don't take what's not ours. And as we see the rise of of political violence, of those taking advantage of the relaxed uh, enforcement of laws in various places, don't you fall into that too? Well, if they're going to be violent, and we've got to be violent too. Nope, not in God's house, we're not. You don't have to agree with every law, nor should you. Not as moral things, but there's even things that are not moral, that you're just like, I really don't like that this is a, a silly building code that we have to have. But you are to submit to the government, Christian. And this is difficult for us to do, especially because we have a democratic republic where we're voting, and you, have a, you are invited to have an opinion and have a say. Have an opinion, have a say, but we, we need to submit to the system because the Lord set it up. And that's not something we hear too often, but there it is in your Bible. Second, he says to be obedient. Be obedient. Could you fairly be defined as an obedient person? Maybe some of the wives in here will go, I hope so. I don't know how many men in here go, oh, I hope so. <laughs> I hope people think I'm obedient. Like that's what dogs go to obedience school. Now hold on a minute though. What does he say? Be obedient. This means you are to fit into your place in society without grumbling and without dissent. That you are not to be constantly fighting against those that have authority over you. So if the first one is about government, the next one could apply to that, but also more broadly, it could apply to parents. Kids, submit to your parents. Don't be disobedient to your parents. There's some, some adults even who kind of like that their kids are rebellious. And they almost kind of encourage them to do that. I, I, maybe some of them feel like they didn't get a chance to sow their wild oats when they were kids, but they're like, oh, yeah, she doesn't listen to anybody. Oh, great. <laughs> that's, I, can't eat, I can't do nothing with her. Oh, that's great, because you've had her since she was a baby. So what are the rest of us supposed to do, right? To your parents. Why, I did mention wives in submission and obedience, the Bible says, to your husbands. You don't want to be the wife who is constantly fighting against your husband and constantly saying, I, I'm going to live my life, and you can't tell me what to do, and I'm going to dig my heels in, and I'm a boss, and you can't do anything to me. Don't live that way. Lots of that online, not in our church. It shouldn't be that way. Submit to your boss. Be obedient to your boss. And you might say, but you haven't met my boss. <laughs> yeah, that's why I can make this statement, because it's not going to color what the Word of God says, huh? I know there's bad bosses out there. I've had a few, right? I, I was a manager. I'm sure I was from time to time a boss people didn't want to be obedient to. But we're not to be unruly. That's what that word means, ruly, like to be ruled, unruly. We're not those that people that are in authority over us and whatever, you know, what, it might be the, you know, the planning committee in your HOA or something. For say, like, oh, this person, she's here. Why does this guy have to sign up for everything? He's not going to do what I tell him to do. That's not what a Christian is supposed to be. Policeman, we could add that, right? Well, I don't have to listen to you. God's my highest authority. Yes, and God as your highest authority told you to be obedient. <laughs> obedient. 1 Timothy 2, 2, Paul told us to pray for the kings and all who are in high positions. For what? That we may lead a peaceful and quiet life, godly and dignified in every way. Let me read that again. What's, what do we want? What's the goal for a Christian? To lead a peaceful and quiet life, godly and dignified in every way. The Christian ideal is to be left alone to pursue your life in righteousness. That you can live as Christ has told you to live with your family and your job and your neighborhood. And if we can do that, then we're to be happy. Not to be constantly feeding our envy or be feeding our, our sense of pride that no one gets to tell me what to do. No one gets to be the boss of me. It doesn't matter if somebody's the boss of you. If Christ died for you, you're going you're gonna to rise with Christ one day and rule and reign on the earth. What is it to you for a short time to submit to somebody that maybe doesn't deserve your submission by their actions, but maybe they do by their rank or by their status? That we fit in to the society. Now, what you can do is you can pull out that little magic box in your pocket, and you can spend a lot of time watching a lot of videos teaching you to be upset and unhappy with your lot in life. And that will cause you to be resentful of the people who are in authority over you. 
I mentioned wives. There's a whole strain of people online that are trying to convince wives just, you know what, don't listen to your husband. If he tries to control you, leave him and take his money. Like, that's a whole trend online. There are people who are going to try to tell you, you're not making enough money. You know, it would be some 16-year-old kid, like, posing in front of a Bugatti like this, and he's like, here's how I make $10,000 a minute, man. And you go, I don't make $10,000 a minute. Am I stupid? And, and it makes you feel, so you show up to a job that you were happy with yesterday, but today you're like, stupid paycheck, stupid boss. He goes, hey, can you get that thing on my desk? I'll get it when you get it. One day I'm going to be standing in front of a Bugatti like this, and you know, I'm going <laughs> to... Don't feed the beast. Those people, yo, you want to you stay informed about issues? Stay informed about the issues. And some of them will be infuriating, but don't, don't find rage bait, you guys. Stuff is just there to keep you angry and keep you mad, because then you don't want to listen to anybody. Let the scriptures teach you. In Christ, again, our position is so lofty, it's foolish to jeopardize your holiness for the sake of your status. When Jesus Christ gave up everything to live as a carpenter, to be scorned by men, to be crucified and shamed, we can do that for a little while, can't we? We can. To be obedient. Number three, maybe less invasive to your life. How about this one? Be ready for every good work. What's a good work? Oh, it's very simple. It's an act of kindness. It's an act of charity. These are things of a practical nature. Be ready for every good work. A Christian's attitude is to be waiting for the chance to leap up and help somebody. That you might be waiting, you might be, you know, on the bench. You ever played basketball, especially where you're sitting on the bench and you're waiting for your time and the coach goes, all right, you're in. You don't want to go, oh, ah, I wasn't prepared for this. I'm not really, can I get a few minutes to kind of wrap my head around it? He's going to go, fine, next guy, right? You're supposed to be ready to jump in at a moment's notice. And the same thing with, the, with anything else, any other sport activity you've done. If you're on the bench, right, you have your chance to leap up and be ready. Same way. In your life, you need to be like that for good works. That if something comes along where you can help somebody, you go, hey, right here, that's me. I'm going to do it. And these don't have to be like major acts of philanthropy that are going to you know, cast a bronze statue of you and put it up downtown. Jesus said in Matthew 10, 42, whoever gives one of these little ones even a cup of cold water because he's a disciple, truly I say to you, he will by no means lose his reward. So when you're out there in the 5K and you're handing out water to people running along, that's you getting a heavenly reward every time you do that. You're just racking up treasure in heaven every time. Jesus made an awful lot of the concept of heavenly rewards and treasures in heaven. Go back and read some of his words again. He talks about it a lot. And we can be all, I've heard this, like, I don't need a reward from Jesus. I just want to serve the, I think it's, it's carnal to motivate people with rewards. Really, you think that Jesus Christ was acting carnally. <laughs> Maybe you need to readjust your definition of carnal. That one day you're going to be rewarded in heaven for all the good that you've done. Even down to, hey, remember when you gave that kid a cup of cold water? Uh, no. Well, I do, and I'm going to reward you for it right now. Ready to do good works. This ranges from all sorts of things. Because some people think, well, look, I, I, I hear good works, and I think of, like, you know, taking food to somebody who's sick, and I'm just, I'm really not good with people, and I can't cook. And we always invent a scenario where we will be totally useless. We don't have the skills for it. But this can be anything that you're doing good for somebody, ranging from bringing a meal to somebody who needs one. And there are folks in our church that do exactly that. It's pretty great. You all cook for each other, and you provide food. My family has benefited from that in our time. It's wonderful. It can be helping a neighbor in their yard. Maybe that's more for the fellows right there. Okay, you know, maybe my wife will be the one to cook the turkey and bring it over and stand on the porch and, you know, have a long cry sesh for, you know, two hours about their life. But I'll be out there raking leaves. Good for you, man. You're helping too. Those are good works also. One is not greater or lesser than the other. It could be that there's a kid or a teenager maybe in your neighborhood or in your, your sphere of influence that you take under your wing because you see them starting to drift and maybe their parents aren't doing a good job helping out or maybe they're uh, not around or they're going through something difficult and you say, hey, you come over here. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to help you out. I'm going to teach you some things. I'm going to show you how to live, how to be a man, how to be a woman. That's, that's great to do that. Wherever there's an urgent need, today there's an urgent need to stack chairs up against the wall. Well, I don't know if... Uh, if that's really my ministry. <laughs> now, you laugh at that. <laughs> People say things like that. I remember my dad was on a missions trip one time, and they were unloading uh, sound equipment because they were going to do a, a concert, and one of the guys wouldn't unload the stuff. And they say, hey, 
so-and-so, can you uh, unload the, help us unload the speakers? He goes, that's not my ministry. Dead serious. Because that's not why I, I didn't come on this mission trip to stack chairs and to unload sound equipment. And um, that's, that's the worst attitude, right? Be ready for every good work. What do you need? Maybe you're like, I don't really know how to serve in the church. Find out who needs help and just go do that. That's a Christian attitude. Don't, don't get so wrapped up in yourself that you miss your chance to serve. Especially if you feel like you're struggling with anxiety or depression or any, you know, the, the slew of usual suspects that you hear about so much today. You got to get out and help some people. Because not only will you realize, you know what, I'm doing okay. Because I don't have whatever need this person had maybe, and th thank God for that. Or it could be just, hey, now that I'm outside of myself and I'm helping another person, I'm receiving that legitimate gratitude, okay, I'm, I'm doing better now. You know, it's lifting up your head and reaching out your hands. And we talk about this as Christmas time a lot, don't we? At the end of every story is the, the grumpy old man starts helping people because that's the Christmas spirit. Why? Because that's what Jesus did. Right? Jesus came and brought us the ultimate gift from the ultimate position of privilege and authority down to the lowest of humility and kindness. So ready for every good work. All the angel tree presents are out there, by the way, guys. Thank you for that. That's an urgent need. It's going to pass out of your hands. You might not ever hear about it again, but somebody's going to be made happy and blessed and hear the word of Jesus Christ because of what you did. Praise the Lord, right? Number four, we are not to speak evil of anyone. Speak evil of no one. The word for speak evil in Greek is blasphemen. That's where we get the word blasphemy or blaspheme. Now, we today in English almost exclusively refer that to talking about the Lord about God. But in this culture, the word is a little broader, and it referred to slander or to speak evil of somebody. Now, many of us can be evil of this one. Maybe we don't do evil to anybody, but have you spoken evil of somebody? That might be a bit of a problem, right? Well, it doesn't count when it's just between me and my wife. Oh, well, God sees that one too, I'm afraid. Words are not idle things. Well, it, just, it was just words. Who cares? You know, and some people want to you know, go all the, all the way and say, you know, if you said the same, something, it's the same thing as doing it. I don't know if that's quite true. But what did Jesus say? He said, out of the overflow of the heart, the mouth speaks. You don't know my heart. I know your words. And Jesus said, that's a pretty good indicator of your heart. The words that you speak, the things that you say, especially about other people. They reveal what's inside you. But you know what else they do? They also train you. The things you say train your heart. So let's use a little pie chart example. Maybe 2% of you is bitter towards somebody. And that 2% speaks 50% of the time. Well, that little 2% of bitterness in your heart is going to grow, isn't it? Because you teach yourself. You train yourself. At the very least, you're going to give off uh, a sense of who you are that's not true to somebody else. Especially if you're maybe somebody like myself who loves to joke around, who loves to tease, who loves to be sarcastic, who can be, you know, a little too quick with a joke sometimes, and you offended or hurt somebody's feelings, and you just go away and you go, I didn't even, I didn't mean to hurt their feelings, I didn't mean to be that way, and you truly didn't. But it, that's what the Lord says, just keep your mouth under control. James says, let everybody be slow to speak, slow to speak. We don't talk quickly, we don't react to things. Ephesians 4.29 says, let no corrupting talk come out of your mouths. So much for cursing, right? But only such as is good for building up as fits the occasion that it may give grace to those who hear. The only things you're supposed to say are things that are going to build up somebody else. Never to tear down. You're only supposed to speak grace to somebody else. Not wrath, not judgment, not wickedness. There's a couple of specific examples the Bible gives us. Exodus 22, 28 says, You will not to speak evil of a ruler of the people. Specifically, God says, Don't revile those who are in authority over you. And there's a lot of shifty, squirmy people right about now, and I'm one of those because I've got strong opinions about some of our elected officials just like you do. And I have conversations where I walk away and I go, Well, I sure expressed myself, but I, I really wish I hadn't said it quite like that. You know, it's, it's really not good how, because you say one thing about your guy and then somebody else is going to say something about their guy and then up it goes and now we're just yelling and screaming at each other. And we say things like, how did everything get so tense around here? Well, because we were speaking evil of each other. 
We cross that threshold of speaking evil of rulers and authorities and even of one another so that now there's no end to it. When you've broken the commandment of God, then the limits are just arbitrary now. Jesus said in Matthew 5, you're not even supposed to insult one another. Jesus said, if you call somebody an empty head, you're going to hell. Jesus said that. You, you think that, oh, I shouldn't murder somebody. He said, but if you say to your brother, Raka, which means empty head, right? You're in danger of the judgment and of hellfire. Or you fool. He says, you're, 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 you should go to court for that. And Jesus said that? He did say that. Insults. Revilings. You may have strong opinions and have those strong opinions, guys. But you are not to be a gossip where you're talking behind somebody's back. Even with the boys, guys. Hey, how's things at home? Man, that old lady, let me tell you right now. And off you go talking about, hey, I love my wife. I just need to let off a little steam. No, you don't. You don't need to let off steam like that. If you've got that much tension going on, you need a prayer life, my friends. Let the Lord lift those things out of you. Because he will. The Lord totally will do that. In fact, Proverbs says, a fool gives full vent to his spirit. But the wise man holds it back. Full vent. That means you open up the vents and let everything that's in come out. And we even say that. Oh, I was just venting. Now the Bible says then you fall in the fool category for doing that. Not to gossip. Not to slander, which is, of course, much stronger. Or do any such thing. One reason I could give you among many is because you don't know what the situation is. Especially, I would say, for our rulers and authorities. This is one of the reasons I'm hesitant to talk about specific uh, political events and issues from up here, even though I might have God's opinion on it, because I don't know if I know what's going on. How many times have we thought, oh my goodness, can you believe that this thing happened? And then like six months later, we find out, oh, that was all a lie. They made that up. I'm like, I'm so glad I didn't stand up in God's pulpit and tell you from Jesus how to think about that. You can start to judge. And and as much as the verse is misused, it's true. Jesus said, judge not lest you be judged. The more you talk about people, that's what people are going to think about you. If the only thing they ever hear from you are your reviling base opinions, they're going to think you're a nasty person. And you might be perfectly delightful, but the only time you ever talk about politics or the only time you ever talk about your family or your job is you're complaining and griping about it. And everyone else will thereby judge you. Everybody in our country now is just very free with the fury, aren't they? It's like, well, I can't, you know, silence is violence. I've got to say something. And it's like, if we don't stand up now, then they'll, they'll run roughshod over us. We need to have a little trust that when we obey God's commandments, he's going to honor us obeying his commandments. And the commandments of God are given for difficult times. Four difficult times. Jesus didn't say, don't ever speak evil of one another unless they do something that ticks you off. Then you can say, no, that only starts to apply when you would like to say something nasty about them. You ever have that friend that is always kind of fishing to have you say something mean about somebody? They'll kind of like set you up like Lucy holding the football for Charlie Brown. It's like, oh, I heard what, uh, what he said to you the other day. What did you think about that? It's like you're just winding up. All right, here it comes. No, 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 we're, we're not supposed to do that. Don't speak evil of anybody. And I'll even say, too, and you can tell I've been thinking about this in the, in the social sphere as I was thinking about it. But, you know, we say, well, I have to say something. Like everybody with that attitude is what's causing so much of the upheaval and the disruption. If everybody would just calm down a little bit, those that are foolish and speaking loudly and, and out of pocket will be seen and known for who they really are. And also, man, you ain't in Congress. All right? <laughs> you're, you're not sitting there in Air Force One being asked your opinions. Live your life. Live your life and be kind to those that are around you, all right? All right, number five, avoid quarreling. Literally in the Greek, this is to be non-combative. Combative is even a a difficult word. You can almost say not fighty. (laughs) Not fighty. It's the word for fighting or battle, and it's negated. So not fighty, not combative. Avoid quarreling. This word can even be used in certain contexts to mean invincible, as in describing a soldier or an army that is so powerful they don't even have to fight because nobody could possibly beat them. But in this context, not talking about invincibility. It's talking about don't, don't get in fights with people. Avoid quarreling. You know what a quarrel is, don't you? A quarrel was a, a bolt you would put in a crossbow 
and shoot at somebody. So when you're quarreling, that's kind of what it feels like, isn't it? You're shooting arrows at one another. Avoid that. Primarily, I think this is about brawling. You don't need to be a brawler in God's church, out there picking fights with people. I don't think there's any of y'all in here, but we should know that, <laughs> that you don't fight. But more than this, it's the attitude of refusing to rise to the bait of the moment. Of the moment. Jesus' famous commandment that we all know, we've all heard, and yet all of us sometimes wish, uh, I wish maybe he had said this a little differently, because that's our flesh talking. You've heard it, it said, an eye for an eye, and a tooth for a tooth, meaning fair is fair. But I say to you, do not resist the one who is evil. But if anyone slaps you on the right cheek, turn to him the other one also. Turn the other cheek. Even to this day, people see Jesus' commandment as weakness. So you're supposed to let somebody beat you up. First of all, the verse is not about being assaulted. It is about being insulted. You understand the difference? That he's not talking about somebody that's going to come and attack you. This is an honor-shame thing. This is an honor-shame culture, as many are even to this day. That if you strike me on the cheek, you know, you haven't, you know, you're not trying to beat me up and take my money. You're insulting me. It's like you're challenging me. What are you going to do about it? Jesus says, turn the other cheek. You want to hit one? Yeah, hit two. Why not? If we can put an end to this, let's put an end to it. It takes strength to walk away from a fight. Don't you know that? Because the people that usually want to get into the always be scrapping and always be fighting, they're usually the, the neurotic, insecure ones. I've got to show everybody how strong and how powerful I am. And I've got to exercise my authority over this person. And, and if the, you give them what they asked for, you've gone down to their level. You're going to have people do this to you. You're going to have somebody pick a fight with you in public, like in the store somewhere. You ever had somebody do that to you? Like, what do you, you want? Do you just want to fight right now? Maybe they want to argue. Maybe they want to actually have a fist fight with you. You know, like in parking lots, you'll hear that a lot. You'll be walking by and somebody will loudly say something about you or loudly say something about your kind. <laughs> and they'll say that because like, they want you to turn around and say, what did you say to me? And now you're fighting. There are people that will call you out in front of people. You'll get people that will just straight up walk up and say, you've been ducking me and now it's time. What are you going to do? You come outside of me right now or we're not doing anything. Or, you know, ladies typically aren't going to get into, like, fist fight or something like that, but they're going to come up and they're going to try to make a scene because they want to fight and argue and scream with you in front of a bunch of people. Maybe you have family that does that. I don't know. Some families are passive-aggressive. Some families are just plain old aggressive. <laughs> you also got people that will give you that sideways insult. You know what I'm talking about? I love how you can just throw on any old thing and just, you know, call that getting dressed up. I'm really very envious of you for that. Or maybe you're... Your father-in-law comes over and he starts commenting on your, your decisions and how you've built the house or where you've organized the furniture. And you're just like, hey. <laughs> and he's like, oh, no, this is great. You know, if it was me, you know, here's what I would have done. And it just, there are all these little digs coming your way. And you can rise to that. You can say, all right, we're having this out right now, you know. Sometimes people write nasty things about you online. People are, are rather brave when there's nobody right in front of their face. Have you noticed that? You ever come across somebody that you can tell, like, wow, you've never been checked by anyone before, have you? You meet them online quite a bit. <laughs> We've been posting a lot of stuff on YouTube lately as a church. Started posting uh, shorts, especially, which are one minute or less that go on YouTube. And they're getting a lot of traffic, which is cool. But, man, people have come out of the woodwork to hate us. Somebody wrote, was it 10 comments yesterday, Zach? I was, I was a... a Thing for, I think it was uh, when John Pilavant was here, he was talking about grace and how you're guilty, but God can forgive you. And some atheist came on and wrote 10 huge comments, just, you guys are stupid. Anybody that believes in God is an idiot. And all these quotes, like he quoted Star Trek in one of them. It was kind of funny, but <laughs> it's like, you know, so. But, and the hilarious thing is he put 10 comments on the video, which means it ended up getting way more views because he was engaging with it. So, like, oh, well, thank you for that, man. And, you know, that guy's cussing, us, cussing me out and saying, you're, you're this and you're that. And, um, but, you know, we have a standing don't feed the troll policy here. If you don't know what a troll is, a troll is somebody online that says nasty, horrible things to provoke a reaction from you. And the joke is when you hop on and start defending your honor. There are people like that in real life, too. They just want to fight. They're bored, and they want to see something happen. Don't participate. When you do that, when you are not a quarreler, you're not combative, you stop the cycle. And eventually people stop messing with you. 
course, there's always a time for war. And again, all these things, there's balanced lessons to be learned. There's a time when you need to step up and defend yourself or defend your family. And, but as a rule, Christians are not combative, pugnacious, fighty people. We don't quarrel. We don't you know, put them up and say, let's just go right now. Let's get it done. Because we're not interested in having arguments and fights with people. Just as Jesus did not. If anybody had a, had a cause to rise to the bait for the things they said about him, it would have been Jesus, don't you think? They were still around in the, in the synagogues and saying, yeah, he casts out demons. You know why? Because he's possessed by the devil. And Jesus actually said, you know that's like an unforgivable sin that you just committed? He could have come in there and with all the thunderous might of the Son of God, like lightning struck right there, and there's a crispy hole where that, that synagogue leader used to be, and he would have been totally justified. But what did Jesus do? He just let it happen, and he stood up and he defended himself, but he didn't get in a fight with anybody. When he's hanging on the cross, what did Jesus say? Father, forgive them. They don't, they don't know. They don't know what they're doing. We go, oh, they should have known. Yeah, they should have, but they didn't. And that's the attitude Jesus had. We're not combative. And I don't think we have a combative congregation, by the way. I mean, I'm, I'm, most of these things, I, I don't have anything pointed to say to our church. These are just general principles to remember. Number six, remind them to be gentle. Remind them to be gentle. So I'm going to remind you, hey, be gentle. Okay? That's usually what you say when you're decorating the Christmas tree with young children, right? It's just, please be gentle. Please be careful with that. And they always manage to find the expensive one and it says baby's first Christmas on it, you know. But gentle here is is not just the way we think about it, which is tender and soft with something. But it it also has the ideas of being reasonable. That same word very often in the New Testament is translated reasonable. So can you see how those two ideas kind of go together? Gentle and reasonable. Uh, To be uh, fair is another way of translating it. To be seemly. That's the way you conduct it. That's seemly. There's not a lot of rough edge to you. There's not always trying to mess something up. It's... The opposite of being pugnacious and spoiling for a fight is to be gentle. Now, especially for the fellows here, don't think that this means that you have to be effeminate to be a Christian. It is not the same thing. Women, I think, have an easier time being gentle than men do. But you also need to remember, guys, that you can be, you know, seven feet tall, 400 pounds, muscles busting out of your eardrums, and be gentle. If you hand a man like that his little baby girl... All of a sudden, he's gentle. He's holding her like this. He's just very tender, very soft, right? Even like grown men, like tough men, will get the little babies, and what do they do? Right? Does that mean that they're not manly, that they're not strong, that they're not capable? No, mess with that guy at your peril. Mess with that little girl and see what's about to happen to you, right? But he's capable of being gentle, being reasonable, being fair. Yeah, you could dominate every room you walk into. You've got the voice and you've got the strength and character to do it, but you don't. I'll be reasonable. Let's go in. Even God said to the people of Israel, let's reason together. Can we talk about this? That's God being gentle with his people. The one who rides in thunderclouds and smoke and dwells in thick darkness and unapproachable light says, let's reason together. That's being gentle. It means to be careful in your conduct. And again, I'm thinking about this a lot in the context of an election year here where we're going to see some things that are going to horrify us. We're going to see some stories come across the line that are going to be shocking and and repulsive to your spirit. But let's remember Psalm 37, verses 10 through 11, where he says, In just a little while, the wicked will be no more. Though you look carefully at his place, he will not be there. But the meek shall inherit the land and delight themselves in abundant peace. You didn't know that Jesus was quoting Psalm 37 when he said, Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth, did you? And that psalm is all about not worrying so much about what wicked people are doing. He says, you're going to look away, and you're going to look back, and they're going to be gone. Maybe even some of the villains from the last crisis, where'd they go? I don't really hear about that guy much anymore. That's why older man David is writing this and says, Fellas, don't worry about it so much. God has a way of handling wicked people. But the ones that last and endure are the ones who are meek or gentle or reasonable. The Bible tells us to let our worries about the wicked go and focus on doing right in your backyard, at your supper table, in your congregation. So we're not to be hot-tempered. You know, you wouldn't like me when I'm angry. Really? When God gets angry, I still like him, so it is possible. 
We're not to be hot-tempered people. We just fly off the handle and it's out of control. Nor are we to have that other extreme where we're wildly emotional, where we can't control our sorrow either. Some, well, I just can't help that. No, the Bible tells us to be gentle, reasonable, self-controlled, meek, to where you're able to, you know, tread this line. I'll never forget this. My eighth grade, not eighth grade, what has this been? Tenth grade. Tenth grade algebra teacher, who was also the basketball coach, and it was a Christian school, and he had to apologize multiple times for losing his temper, temper during the basketball games because he would get really into it. But he would come into the class. We'd talk about math. We'd also talk about the Lord. He was a really cool guy. And he had, a, I remember this, a green uh, expo marker and a red one. And he's on the, on the whiteboard, and he says, doing red, big old waves like this. We were talking about sine waves. So that's where this came in. And he says, you know, you can be up one day and down, and you're all up and down like this, and you're really angry, and then you're really sad, or you're really happy, and then you're really depressed. And he said, what God wants to do, and he would take the green marker and just do a little short one like this, is you have the same emotions, but they're not so out of control that you're swinging back and forth. Mr. Patterson was his name. I remember that right now. He was a fun guy to have in that class. But we're not to be wildly emotional. We're gentle with people. We are patient Patient. And we're kind even when we have to be firm with people. You can be kind and firm at the same time, can't you? And it's better to be kind and firm. Because if you have to be firm with somebody or say no or yes strongly to somebody, maybe one of the tactics they'll use in order to get out of that is try to get you mad and start a fight. But if you can be the one that stands firm and says, no, we're not going to fight about this, nor am I changing my mind on this subject. They'll burn off that, that temper, and then it'll all be all right after that. And they'll respect you for it. We don't, as Christians, feel a need to prove that we're tough. We don't need to prove anything to anybody. We just stand steady. And I can just ask this question. Wouldn't the world be a better place if there were more people like this? More gentle people? You know, we used to use that word more often, a gentleman. A gentleman. Well, I don't want to be gentle. Well, it's, a, it's one of the fruits of the Spirit, guys. Gentleness, reasonableness, calmness, self-control, the ability to defer your might and power for the moment in order to have a better situation. So I'm reminding you to be gentle, to be gentle. And the last one, number seven, is to show perfect courtesy to all people. Do what you go, oh man, all of them? <laughs> all of them? I got to show courtesy to all of them, Lord? That's what he said. What is courtesy? Oh, it's, it's not hard. It's kindness. It's manners. Manners. That's a lost art. Can I tell you a funny story that you might not believe, but I'll, I promise you this is true? We were on a missions trip to Costa Rica with the high school students. And uh, we would go out during the day, and then we would have, this was always the most fun, we would be out for hours after we got back and had our dinner, just talking and laughing. And you never laugh so hard in your life when you're hanging out with those guys. Well, I don't know how we got on this, but we were sitting there talking, you know, as boys and girls, sometimes things come up, and uh, somebody mentioned something about manners or politeness or etiquette. And then I spent like an hour, and then for the rest of the trip, fielding etiquette questions from teenagers. <laughs> it was the strangest thing, because it was like, these are a bunch, you know, they're a bunch of Gen Z knuckleheads that were throwing each other in the pool and, you know, all, all that crazy stuff. But they, they were asking about manners. Like, yeah, we really don't do that anymore. Why don't we do that anymore? You know, especially the ladies, like, I go back and I watch Pride and Prejudice. I'm like, oh, I wish we talked that way, and I wish we still dressed that way. And, you know, the fellow's like, yeah, I mean, like, I, you know, maybe not Pride and Prejudice, you know, but they're like, <laughs> you know, it just feels like everything is all so informal all the time. What, and so, as best I know, I was like, look, Googling stuff, like, what is the appropriate thing to say in this situation? And it was fun, talking about manners and kindness and courtesy. But it's not so much about, like, social conventions as much as it is that Christians are polite. Are you polite? Are you polite? I hope you are. Because a Christian is to be polite. Are you working on it, at least, to be polite? We're not rude. Love is not rude, 1 Corinthians 3 says. We're not pushy. Well, how are you supposed to get what you want? You're supposed to rely on God to get you what you want. And also, a gentle answer turns away wrath, doesn't it? When somebody's like, I'm ready to take this person down, especially at like a service job. You know, you walk up and somebody has been dealing with customers all day long and like the last 10 have just been real nasty to them. So they show up and they're already like, you know, an old Western, like with their guns drawn, like ready to go. And you show up and you say, hey, Merry Christmas. How are you doing? I'm fine. What do you want? <laughs> well, I'm just having some time. You're kind. You, that person like, wow, one kind person, all this mess, showing me courtesy. I'm going to help you as much as I can. Catlin did this when we flew together. We went out to New Mexico, 
you know, I, I've been flying a lot lately, and I've been all over the place. So TSA and I have a nice little, you know, uh, <laughs> frenemy relationship, I guess. <laughs> you know, it's, it's, if they could just agree on the rules. It's like, do I or do I not take my shoes off? Just tell me once and for all, you know. Well, I just go in and, you know, I'm just kind of walking through, and my, my thought is just kind of have it ready, you know, kind of keep that face, you know, so they know, all right, we don't want to try to mess with this guy. And, and she walks up to everybody, hello, we're going to New Mexico. And, and you know what starts happening? Everybody's being super nice to us. And they're just kind of hustling us through things. And we go over to, you know, get coffee. And the person was, you can hear them like snipping about that. I'm like, listen to these. They're complaining about that girl over there. And Catla walks up, hello, how are you? <laughs> and you know, oh, you haven't, it's got to be so busy today. And like, yeah, it's real busy. I'm so sorry. But hey, you know what? It's, at least you're almost going to get off your shift, right? And like, yeah. And like, you know what? Take two. Take three of these, you know? <laughs> and it reminded me, wow. Yeah, that, that is important, isn't it? Perfect courtesy. We're not pushy, nor are we passive aggressive, by the way. That's when you're being pushy, but you're pretending to be polite. Like, it's okay if you want to take as long as you want on that coffee. I know that I should just, I should, you know, be concerned about you, you know. Everybody says the customer is always right. I don't think that. You just take your time there. And you pick up, no, no, I can't be there right now. This sweet young lady is making a cup. And, and it's a hard job. And that's, ugh, that's, that's horrible, isn't it? That makes you, you want to put something else in that coffee. You know, what? I didn't say anything. You know, isn't that frustrating? I didn't say, you know what you did, right? You know what you said. That's, by the way, why you should never have any kind of substantive conversation through text message or email, because you can't read tone. And sometimes that's what people want. I want to just be able to say what I think because they never say it to your face. If you can't say it to their face, maybe you shouldn't say it. Pick up the phone and call or just wait until you see them in person. That's kind of what I do. When somebody has a big, long complaining email about the, the ministry or whatever, my immediate response is, what time do you want to come in and talk about this in person? Why, because I don't have time for the email? No, because I know it's just not going to go anywhere. Because you're going you're gonna to read something into what I say and I'll read something into what you say and we could probably resolve this in five minutes. If we could just talk. So courtesy, courtesy. We're poised, we're thoughtful to other people. Romans 12, 18 says, if possible, meaning it's not always possible, but if possible, so far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all men. With all men. As much as it depends on you. What about that really nasty neighbor who's always calling the cops on people for stupid stuff? Well, as far as it depends on you, live peaceably with that guy. Your day may come where you guys, you've got to be hollering over the fence at him too, but as far as it depends on you, let it go. What about that person in the office that everybody's like, don't just watch out for her, okay, because she, she's a barracuda and she will rip you to shreds if you give her half a chance, right? Well, as far as it depends on you, live peaceably with her. You might not approve of how she treats anybody else, but as far as it depends on you, you live peaceably. We don't adjust our courtesy either based on wealth Oh, somebody rich walked in the room. Everybody, you know, straighten up, act nice now. Or the opposite of that. Some people will do that. Oh, look who thinks they're so high and mighty. You can go to the back of the line. People will do that. Or their position. I've said this since we were in the hotel, and I'm going to keep on saying it. The day may come where we get somebody famous or powerful or notable in this congregation. Here's the rule. You don't treat them any differently than you treat anybody else. Oh, please, take my seat. No, none of that. None of that, because when you walk in here, those things don't matter anymore. There is no Jew or Greek or slave or free or any of those things. And it, that might mean you need to start treating everybody else better now. <laughs> Am I right? Okay, I need, maybe I need to start giving up my seat now and, and you know, welcoming people at the door and you know, just pumping their head. It's so good to see you, you know, and that's, that's good. Or even things, guys, like, like beauty. The attractive person gets treated well and the unattractive person doesn't. This is the joke that guys have been making since middle school, that if an if a ugly guy and a hot guy say the same exact thing in the same exact way to a girl, the ugly one is a stalker. <laughs> and the hot one is just so charming, I can't stand it. Yeah, we're on to you, ladies, that's what I'm saying. Some of you guys are like, I knew it! I knew they were doing that! We don't adjust our courtesy to one another based on, on things like that, guys. That's how the world treats people. But in God's church, we know that none of us have anything desirable before God, and yet he reached down to save us anyway. So you don't look for desirable qualities in somebody else, deciding on whether or not you're going to treat them with courtesy. Simple things like opening doors for people 
especially, gentlemen, for the ladies. Get your kids to do it. My, my boys will fight over who gets to open the door for strangers now. And I'm like, I just grab you both by the ear and say, I'll do it, because now they can't even get in the place. <laughs> Opening doors. Saying please and thank you. It matters to people. You notice it, don't you? When somebody is polite and kind to you. And we can even disagree with grace. That's why I told you, I've said this a million times, I love reading like the history from the American Revolution especially. And even when they're like angry at each other, it's like the most florid, like complimentary language. And I'm challenging you to a duel. Your humble, obedient servant. It's like, wow, okay. And they're like, well, that's hypocritical. Yeah, but at least there was the, the acknowledgement that this is how it should be. We should be courteous to each other, right? Be gentlemanly or ladylike for Christ's sake. And today's media, advertisement, whatever it is, TV, it it glamorizes the opposite of that. It glamorizes, you know, speech that comes from the gutter. It glamorizes treating other people selfishly and and only worrying about yourself. It it glamorizes tearing down those that have that that sense of self-control. But don't worry about that. We rise above it because we've got a higher reason, and that's Jesus, who told us to treat everybody with perfect courtesy. Perfect courtesy. So seven things here. Let's just read it again. Remind them, as I have, to be submissive to rulers and authorities, to be obedient, to be ready for every good work, to speak evil of no one, to avoid quarreling, to be gentle, and to show perfect courtesy toward all people. Altogether, those character traits constitute a rather pleasant person, don't they? But also a rather strong person who is able to stand and deliver these things even in the face of difficulty. Somebody who minds their own business, but is a blessing to everybody around them. That's how I want to live. That's how I hope you want to live, because that's how Jesus and Paul and Titus remind us to live. And that's what sound doctrine teaches us to live, which is why it baffles me that doctrinal things online are the place where there's the most venomous arguments. When the Bible tells us that sound doctrine trains us to live like this. So look to your hands, guys, not just your head when it comes to the things of the Lord. What are you doing How are you speaking? How are you conducting yourself? Verse 3, For we ourselves were once foolish, disobedient, led astray, slaves to various passions and pleasures, passing our days in malice and envy, hated by others and hating one another. We're going to break off in the middle of a thought here because we have to, but the most common objections to the life that I just described of courtesy and kindness and gentleness and all the rest, concern other people (laughs) and the way they act. When you say, you know, turn the other cheek, what's the first question? Well, what if somebody, be gentle to all people. Well, you haven't met my, speak no evil of the rulers of your people. Have you seen this dude? Other people and their provoking ways. But Paul reminds Titus that one of the reasons we act this way, even when other people are not, is because we were just like them before we found Christ, and that we are needed now to represent Christ in a world that refuses to live this way. I'm going to go quickly through these things here because we spend enough time talking about the wrong way to do things, but foolish, we used to be foolish. That's the Proverbs definition, acting stupidly as if God was not real and doing foolish things. Disobedient, somebody who flouts authority, somebody who makes a scene when they get caught. Led astray, led astray by the devil, by other bad influences, slaves to passions and pleasures, slaves to our impulses, only doing what feels good, in malice and envy, no love towards other people. Everything is a competition between me and them, and if I'm going to fight this fight, then I'm going to win and get out of my way. Hated and hating, hated by other people and hating other people ourselves. Call it prejudice, call it anger, call it spite, whatever you call it. All sorts of excuses now about why we can act hateful to other people when that's the old life. Yes, people act this way. Maybe there's even some faces or some groups in your mind as I described these things and read that list. But guess what? We did all those things too before the grace of God came. We were acting foolishly. We were led astray. We were hateful. We were slaves to our impulses. And even today, sometimes we still struggle with the residual effects of those things. And it was the grace of God that came to us. 1 Corinthians 6, 11 says, Such were some of you, but you were washed, you were sanctified, 
You were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ by the Spirit of our God. Hey, you might have these virtues, and that's great, but I'm going to remind you the reason you have them is because of the blood of Jesus and the power of the Holy Spirit. It's God manifesting these things in you. So it should not be a point of arrogance and pride and judgmentalism for you that you act this way and the rest of the world doesn't. They don't know Christ yet. Of course they're going to act like that. They should know better. Yes. But a little thing happened in the Garden of Eden that kind of messed all that up. We shouldn't be angry at the world for acting like the world. Now, there is indignation towards sin. I'm not not saying we shouldn't have that. But there, there must be a personal level where you are not angry, but you're sympathetic. You're like, I get it because I was like that. And I can still feel my flesh, you know, tensing up that I could be like that again if it wasn't for Jesus. So I'm not going to walk around condemning other people for not being gentle or for being quarrelsome or for reviling one another because I used to do that. I don't expect holiness from you because you haven't met the Holy One yet. And as much as we remember how we've been forgiven, when you look back and you think, yeah, I remember what I was like. I remember how I used to talk to people. I remember how I treated that man or treated that woman. I remember how I used to conduct myself in the workplace or in the political sphere. And you remember what you're like, and sometimes we get embarrassed. We're kind of like, uh, it's kind of like when Jesus said, he was out sin, let him cast the first stone. Everybody goes, oh, look at the time. I better get out of here, right? It humbles us. It embarrasses us. It humbles us. But then what do we immediately do? What, but I've been saved. Yeah, you have. You turn to Christ, but I've been forgiven for all that. And that love for Jesus starts to grow in your heart again and say, thank you, Jesus, so much. Luke 7, 47, he's forgiven much, loves much. But whoever's forgiven little, loves little. So if you start to forget what you've been forgiven of and you've only got a little bit of forgiveness left in your heart, you're only going to love a little bit. But you turn, oh, I've been forgiven, praise Jesus. So then what about those that have not found him yet? Can you not be like Jesus as the nails were going through his hands who said, Father, forgive them? They don't know what they're doing. Maybe as you look at the things that are infuriating, infuriating on your computer screen or TV or that you're hearing from your neighbor's house or you're seeing your children's life and it, it, it makes you rightly anger, but there should be a moment where you get on your knees and say, God, they don't know. They don't know. They need to know. Help me to tell them because I didn't know. And I was just like that. But now I do know, and the forgiveness and freedom I found in Christ, Lord God, they need that too. So it's a pretty straightforward message today, isn't it? I mean, you could just say, be good, <laughs> be nice. That's the, what was today's church about. How about being nice, about being good, being kind, being respectful, showing love and courtesy to all people. Very general picture of what a Christian in society looks like. That when you come across one of us, that's what it should be like. Doesn't mean that everyone's going to be like that to you in return, but more of them will than if you're going to act nasty, I would say. This is the example that we are to follow. And guys, there's always going to be reasons to break these commandments. There's always going to be a good reason that other people would say, well, you you had to do what you had to do. But the Lord has said, I see all things, and this is how I want you to be. Right? Our default position always comes back to this, to love, to sum it all up. And we are to love one another. Love our neighbors as ourselves. It is up to us now to live as Christ did for the sake of those who are lost, who are stuck in this constant, endless cycle of offense and sin and blasphemy against each other. And Jesus has sent us out to be the ones to take those things on ourselves, much in the way he did, and not to return evil for evil. That we break the cycle and then introduce the one who's able to continue to break it in somebody else's life. And that's our Lord Jesus.